Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're just waiting for people to come in. We have a lot of people in the waiting room. It's so good to see everybody. Great to see the screen fill up with all the little squares. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> mm. So hello and welcome everyone to Banyan. I'm Willem, the CEO and one of the co-founders here at Banyan. And we are a collective of thousands of people from around the world who come together to practice and grow in inner freedom, compassion, and love. And together, we explore our deepest insights and turn them into meaningful changes in our lives for the benefit of ourselves and the world. We offer hundreds of live <laughs> sessions each week where people come together and practice guided by amazing teachers. We also offer exclusive hour-long talks from teachers and leaders who are doing important work in their respective areas. And we opened today's exciting talk to the public to share the experience with those new to Banyan and our thriving community. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, welcome. We are so excited to have you join us. Today's talk is about psychedelics and mindfulness. Both are powerful tools with the potential to transform our minds that can serve as a gateway to deeper self-discovery, healing and growth, and that can help us usher in a more compassionate, connected and awakened world. And I'm so honored to have two amazing speakers with us today who are the perfect people to explore this terrain with us. Louis Schwartzberg of Fantastic Fungi fame, and Jack Cornfield, our beloved teacher and co-founder of Banyan. Now, this topic resonates deeply with me as I've been navigating these waters <clears throat> in my own journey over the past years. So I'm excited to listen alongside you as we dive into this topic and discover how psychedelics and mindfulness can come together. As we hear about the roles that each can play and how we can integrate the insights that psychedelics can offer us into our everyday life, because that's really what we're all about at Banyan, making real changes in our lives. So welcome again to all of you. It's so great to have you here. And now I will turn it over to Emily, our beloved community manager here at Banyan, who will introduce our speakers and guide our time today. Emily, over to you. Thanks so much, Willem. Thanks for being here, everyone. It's been great to scroll through and see who's here with us today. Uh, as Willem said, I'm the community manager at Banyan, and I'm joined today behind the scenes with Muge and Jody. Um, so first I'll introduce Jack and Louie, and then as they're having their conversation, we welcome you to think of questions that come up in your minds uh, in line with what's being discussed today. Uh, we have a Q&A feature that you'll see if you look at the bottom of your screen, you may have to click more to find it, but put your question in using the Q&A feature, and that'll give you the chance to see what other people are asking. So that might make you think of a different question if you already see yours there, or you can vote for somebody else's question if it's really interesting to you. Uh, so we'll use that to kind of organize questions during the conversation. And then when the guys are ready, they'll um, open it yeah. up to questions. And if you would like to be able to dialogue with them directly, a good way to do that is show us that you're engaged, have your camera on. Um, we may send you a note that, hey, your question was selected. Are you ready? Uh, so just look for that in the chat. Um, so, and we will not be using the hand raise feature. If you think of a question and you wanna just click their hand raise, we'll just help you <laughs> put your hand down. We won't use that today. We'll use the Q and A feature. Um, so I will begin by introducing Louie. Louis Schwartzberg is a renowned filmmaker, director, and cinematographer with a 40-year career showcasing nature's beauty 
through breathtaking imagery using innovative time-lapse, high-speed, and macro cinematography techniques. He's inspired millions with his TED Talks and films like Fantastic Fungi and the Netflix series Moving Art. Louis' recent work includes Gratitude Revealed and launching the Louis Channel in 2023, which is carefully curated to cultivate awe and wonder, deepening our connection to the earth and to each other. Thanks so much for being here, Louis. It's an honor to be here. Oh, so glad you're here. And then I'll introduce our, our dear Jack. Jack trained <clears throat> as a monk in Thailand, India, and Burma, beginning teaching meditation internationally in 1974, and is credited as one of the key teachers to introduce Buddhist mindfulness practice to the West. Jack holds a PhD in clinical psychology and has authored many books, sold over a million copies, translated in over 20 languages. He's co-founded the Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts, the Spirit Rock Center in California, and also he has co-founded this space, Banyan, that you're enjoying today. So grateful to both of you for being here. Jack, I'll hand it over to you, and we're hoping you may be willing to lead us in meditation. Thank you. Hi, Louis. Great to see you. Um, very glad to have this time together. Louis is a friend and somebody I admire a lot, and um, we've worked together a bit, and uh, that's been an honor for me. Um, welcome to you all. And let's just take a couple of minutes to kind of quiet the mind and come a bit into the present. Also, I, I, I have to check again. Um, is this 60 minutes? Is that correct? How much time do we have? Yes. Okay. Well, then we better get <laughs> to the meditation on your mark, etc. Settle yourself, please. Find a way that your body is at ease where you are. Feel the weight of your body being met by the earth, that you can rest on her since you come from the earth and you're completely supported just by letting your body be connected with the seat, the floor. Let your eyes close, if you will, gently or lower your gaze. And just bring your attention here and now the future and the past <clears throat> are just thoughts. Come into the reality of the present, just where you are. And as you do, begin to notice how your body is breathing all by itself, the rise and fall of chest and belly or the coolness of the air and feel how it breathes itself. It's breathing in this ocean of air, interbreathing with the trees around you. You trade carbon dioxide and oxygen with all the leaves of the trees and the grasses, and they breathe with you. For what is breathing is the earth herself. The earth is breathing you, and you can sense this, relax, and settle into the breath. This breath that breathes with the local badgers and birds, with the plants and flowers, with all the human beings, all exchanging our breath. And feel how trustworthy it is that the earth breathes you. Mm. You can relax and feel the rhythm of life. The breath that connects us all.
and around the breath, there will be thoughts and feelings and sounds like waves of the ocean. They come and go. And in the middle is this ever-changing, mysterious breathing that connects us again and again. Let yourself return to this breath. And finally, put a half smile on your face for the delight of being alive, mm -hmm. of breathing with all beings together, of being part of this living, breathing earth herself. And then staying with the sense of presence here and now let your eyes open and we come back to you in our little squares but we're actually bigger than our squares just so you know <laughs> uh hi louis i'm so happy we get to have this conversation um and i'll just say a couple things and ask you a question um we both <laughs> as many people listening have a history with psychedelics um and mine started um, back in the 60s back in the day and most every buddhist teacher of my generation got started with psychedelics you name them and i'll tell you <laughs> they mm. were dripping um but there was something more important we were looking for something and we live in a culture that's almost defined it sometimes by the absence of the sacred and yet we feel that this kind of yearning this intuitive wish to connect whether it's going high in the mountains or making love or taking psychedelics or meditating and i was drawn yes i was in Haight ashbury in the 60s and took my share of acid and but i was drawn to go to a buddhist monastery because i wanted to understand and i could feel from the psychedelics as many of the founding mm -hmm. features of current buddhist western buddhist community that there was something mysterious and really important and so i went off to find it and did in all kinds of ways and written about and talked about but one of the great things that i discovered which willem mentioned and louis speaks to so much is that you can't separate psychedelics from life um and it's one thing to do a trip and say okay i had an experience it's like going to you know the theme park i went to disneyland i had a great ride but it's another to sense that these are actually a gateway to a shift of consciousness that sees the sacred and the beauty around us um, and then they can be complements they can serve one another in mysterious and amazing ways so I'll spoke a little and let's yeah. see what Louis wants to dive into. Probably. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jack. And I'd love and admire everything that you do. It's been a joy to work with you as well. Yeah, I, I also got turned on in the late 60s and early 70s at UCLA. I was a poli sci history major. I started to get into photography by documenting the anti-war protests and the police brutality that was happening on campus. How could I study the French Revolution when there was one happening literally outside my door? And that turned me on to photography. Photography was a way to become a little more present because I could look at rhythms and patterns that I'd never seen before. And then I hitchhiked, which was another experience of total freedom, uh, up the coast during a spring break ended up on the border between California and Oregon. And that's when I took my first psychedelic trip. And there was forest, ocean, even a giant sand dune. And I couldn't, eat, I couldn't put it all in a lens. My lens wasn't wide enough to capture it. But I do remember having the most incredible revelation, which is that 
everything is energy. And I never read about that. I never thought about that. I just saw it. I experienced that everything was energy. And then that night, as I built a, a fire, you know, to keep myself warm, just, you know, camping out there, I, I saw that even the wood, the dead wood that I had found and created a fire for warmth was a transformation of energy. You know, um, the wood was burning and getting heat energy off of it. And er, that, that life is every life is change and energy is change. And I think that experience shifted my whole perspective and once you have that you can never come back and it certainly has influenced on my filmmaking because then i got i started to experiment with time lapse to bend time uh, micro macro cinematography to look at things that the human eye can't see a lot of the work i do i think is to make the invisible visible and that's the perfect description of what a psychedelic journey is like making the invisible visible beings we're surrounded by so much energy we don't see you know um as as someone that's into photography you know we look at the visible light spectrum i'm aware of that but infrared x-ray gamma ray you know science has all this these other wavelengths of energy we don't see yet they are um, they're part of our universe and so i love being able to expand our horizons and our perceptions, which is the same thing that you know, I think mindfulness practices do, is to be able to open up from that narrow perception we see every day. You know, um, you're you know you're describing your kind of awakening in there in the sand dunes on the border of Oregon and in California and so forth. Um, it's interesting. A lot of times we think of spiritual practice as kind of a path that if we're good and we practice mindfulness and compassion and patience and tolerance and dedication and so forth, we'll get to some goal somewhere. It becomes kind of a path. Um, but actually it's the reverse. We're not going from here to there. We're going from there to here. Um, and in, in that regard, um, psychedelics in some way open us to a revelation you talked about. And it happened for me um, in which I saw the world. It was not only energy. That's one language for it, a beautiful language. The a language of the sacred was another. Um, another is that sometimes you can see it's made of light energy in a certain way is is light um i believe uh, our friend albert had some little equation about that <laughs> yes um and um to be able to see the world luminous like we were doing that breath practice to feel that you're being breathed by the earth with all beings all of this is this beautiful kind of remembering of who you are um and a Korean, great Korean Zen master, um, Sue Neal, he kind of flipped the <clears throat> script of development to have some enlightenment. And his teaching was sudden, sudden enlightenment, then gradual practice, mm -hmm. which is really what our lives, are. yours and mine, Louis, and many of you listening, there are openings that come from psychedelics and visions and so forth. And then as Willem talked about too, the game is, how do I live this? How do I embody? How do I keep that? Which is part of what your work as an artist and cinematographer and all of that yeah. is um, is about. Yeah, well, I think a good friend of ours, you know, Albert Einstein, as you mentioned, you know, I think they asked him his definition of God and he said it was a sense of wonder. And if you don't feel that and your eyes are closed, you might as well be dead. So um, I think that psychedelics and nature open you up to wonder and curiosity. You know, for me, that's the intersection between art and science. And it's where it makes you present. Because in that moment, staring at a flower, and as you know, it wasn't, didn't the Buddha tell his disciples that if you want 
to learn everything there is to know, stare at a flower, you know? And it's pretty having, close. He picked a flower and somebody got enlightened as he held the flower up in his hand. One of his great disciples saw the flower and that was it. Yeah. And he saw it deeply, exactly. So all your flowers, you're really enlightening people. Everybody's yeah. they're sitting in the in the movie theater with their popcorn. And then this bud comes on and all of a sudden this enormous flower opens and they say, that's us. That's me. Yeah. That's this world. Yeah. And, and the beautiful part <clears throat> about that is that that wonder and curiosity, you know, seduces you with beauty to be able to watch the flower do a dance. You know, it, they're doing that dance all the time, but we don't see it because we live in a different time frame. But what it does is it, it hopefully encourages you to lean in to looking at things more deeply, to be able to not just walk by the flower and be superficial about its beauty and what it does. If you really look at the flower, oh my God, look at that pattern. It's seducing the pollinators with, with, with like color and pattern and aroma to enable it to reproduce. And because it does that, we get all the fruits, nuts, vegetables, and the healthy food we need to eat. There is a deeper story happening that is the foundation of life on our planet. And yet we can be superficial and just walk by it and go, oh, it's just a flower. Something I'm going to give my, my loved one when I mess up on, on Valentine's Day. It's way bigger than that, you know? And I feel that what, a, what we're doing is to turn people on. You know, and beauty isn't anything we, we have to go to school to learn. We're hardwired to feel it. It's in our DNA because it, it influences reproduction. It influences survival. Um, we, we appreciate things and we're connected to things because of these wavelengths of energy. As you said, light energy is what you saw on your first trip. Well, light energy is the source of all energy on our planet and um, to be able to be aware and navigate that and to understand it again is just another beautiful metaphor to be more open-minded how many people on a, on a psychedelic trip have stared at a flower or a blade of grass for an hour and and then one one last thing jack i want to share with you too is how you talked about my flowers if you ask someone to meditate and stare at, at that rose bud, it might take three days for it to open. And but do, do you have to keep looking at it. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't eat. I can show you what that experience is like with my time lapse camera. I can show you in 10 seconds what three days going by, what that flower is actually doing as it dances and in, in responds to light energy. So I'm giving. I think people a window and into a portal of of time and scale that hopefully can open your consciousness. Beautiful. You're also talking about what Suzuki Roshi called beginner's mind. Mm. You know, because when a child sees the try, I remember when my daughter was, you know, 18 months old or two years, and I was holding her, she was learning language. And I'd go around and I'd say, Well, this is a rose bush. I'd sort of give it a name and I introduce, say hello to the rose bush. It's like Zen Master Suzuki Roshi's beginner's mind was really saying, we can live, as you said, with a sense of wonder and freshness. Um, the poet says, the earth laughs in flowers, that, that there's something about life, the beauty you talk about manifesting that way. So, I worked together and have, or been a collaborator for almost 50 years with uh, Stanislav, Stan Grof. Mm -hmm. And I met him in the early 70s when I came back from Buddhist monastery. And he was the last um, psychedelic researcher as a physician at Johns Hopkins before the laws were changed. And he had this amazing project. He and he was married at that time to Joan Halifax. Um, and one of the things that was really helpful, we did two things together uh, that was really helpful. The first is that we exchanged maps because the Buddhist uh, psychology um, and Buddhist teachings have this have beautiful maps of consciousness, different states of 
samadhi and jhana and luminosity, um, maps of the difficulties, the hindrances you go through, the ways to overcome those obstacles to inner freedom and compassion. And then he showed the map, he wrote about it, he said, after giving 5,000 people high dose LSD, this is what we found. And the maps included first, the change of perception where everything be, starts to melt and dissolve the energetic change and you go, whoa, it's not solid. It is this, this dance of energy. And then there's the inner map that when that layer sometimes opens up you and your body dissolves and so forth, you go into history and you have a personal layer, you have deep memories and traumas and exquisite things of your past and they all get revealed in psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And then if you get quiet and deeper, sometimes you go to the perinatal level where you relive your birth in psychedelics, pretty common being in the womb, but getting born. And then you can feel in a deeper layer, the transpersonal or spiritual dimension where you feel everything being born or you become the redwood tree and the salmon and all of those things. And once I had the maps from the Buddhist side and the psychedelic side, so I could sort of, okay, how do I wander here? How can I use these to understand right. and stay centered? Then we put them together and people would do his holotropic breath work, which is like a psychedelic journey for <clears> hours <throat> in groups. And in between for a retreat, we would sit and practice mindful, compassion, loving awareness. And the two of them fit together beautifully so that when you left the retreat, having had these psychedelic type experiences, you could carry that sense of wonder and openness that you're talking about, Louis, mm -hmm. as part of your practice and know how to do it, to quiet your mind, to open your heart, to say this day, yes, I have to go to work or whatever. Let me see the luminosity in it. Let me see the beauty and not pass it by. I love it. You know, the, the combination of, of art and science is something that we actually recently did at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute here in Santa Monica. So we did, there was a clinical trial to treat people with alcohol addiction. And what we did was they watched my video of rhythms and patterns of nature on a giant 80 inch 4K TV as they were coming on to psilocybin. And then they did the traditional therapeutic practice of laying down with a the therapist with eye shades and headphones. And then I had a short video to help them become grounded at the end, you know, earthy, earth tones and um, shafts of light and canyons, things like that. And so the results showed, which got published in Frontiers of Psychiatry, and this is the first study that's ever been done like this. It showed that the combination of my nature imagery with psilocybin was more effective than the psilocybin by itself. And there had been previous studies where psilocybin had been used at Johns Hopkins and NYU, guys like Steve Ross and Roland Griffiths and Charlie Grove here at UCLA, you know, showing how psychedelics can be a powerful therapeutic tool for, you know, addiction and PTSD. But to see that the combination was better than psilocybin by itself, and that obviously goes to this awareness we well know about set and setting. It's not just about taking this thing, it's about the intention of what you want to hopefully explore and the environment that you're in. And, and, and if you can't be outside in nature, the ability to watch my imagery, which isn't just nature, it's nature that uh, bends time and scale, which is what psychedelics do. So I think it kind of facilitates you on that journey of feeling the connectedness. And, and for me, the, the ultimate benefit when you saw like in Fantastic Fungi, the patients at Johns Hopkins who were suffering from, you know, a severe, you know, diagnosis of cancer and looking at possible end of life, what was their takeaway? Their takeaway was they lost their fear of dying because they felt connected with everything. And what an incredible gift to be able to give someone who is faced with that dilemma 
A, I might be dying. Physiologically, things are going wrong. But mentally, what the fuck? <laughs> Where, what's going to happen? Where am I going? Especially if they've never had a spiritual experience. Especially if they're maybe stuck in the old paradigm of some religion of heaven and hell. What a frightening cliff to be standing on at that moment. When And so the benefit of losing your fear of dying, I believe, helps you heal. Mind and body is connected. You can't separate the two. We know that. So if you can ease the anxiety, those patients that I filmed are still alive. Yeah. And what you're talking about is also reclaiming the human heritage of the wisdom of these substances as well as the inner trainings because they're all originally part of the indigenous world Exactly. Whether it's the Ayahuascaros or Ibogaine or, you know, I used to sit with Don Jose Matsua, Don Jose Rios, this 101, 103-year-old Huichol shaman in peyote, peyote ceremonies. And we would sit up all night and chant and take the take peyote. And it, it wasn't the peyote alone, although that was powerful, but it was also sitting in community in the middle of the redwoods by a waterfall. Um, and all of a sudden we realize, you know, that we are part of this natural world in a way that you don't, I mean, I grew up in the suburbs and <laughs> that wasn't part of the curriculum. Right. Um, so uh, there's something we're reclaiming our humanity and reclaiming the sacred by doing this. Um, and yeah. also, it's incredibly important that we have community, which is why yes. perhaps these groups at Banyan will be really good, because in ways you need to talk about it. I had this amazing experience, or I had this terrifying experience. But if you have the maps, it yeah. turns out that when you have a difficult experience, there are ways, as in meditation, to become the loving witness of it, the loving awareness, and say, oh, birth and death, joy and sorrow, good and evil, pleasure and pain, um, you know, night and day, the opposites create the world. Um, and I can step back and see the dance of it, that it mm -hmm. can't just be one-sided, it's only going to be birth, it has to be renewing itself. And that understanding translates into how we hold the unbearable suffering and the unbearable beauty of life, the whole thing, how do we hold that? which is what we are um, from a vision of what makes it holy. And that's the freedom that comes. So there's this profound coming together of the perspectives that dates back thousands of years in the Buddhist tradition and tens of thousands of years in the indigenous tradition. Right. And they all invite us into this. And then people will ask, I'm going to say one more thing, but does <laughs> Buddhism have like, precepts, you shouldn't take drugs, you shouldn't get intoxicated. And it does. I mean, in some traditions, in the in the Hindu Vedic tradition, there was soma. There's a, there right. was a, it probably was mushrooms, but it could have been something else. You know, in in traditions around the world, there are there's the use of sacred substances. But the real translation of that Buddhist precept is to not take substances that lead you to intoxication in an unhealthy or unskillful way. So you're not getting drunk and thereafter doing all kinds of other things that harm you and harm other people. This is the opposite. Yeah. And yes, everything can be, even psychedelics can be misused. Everything can be sure. misused. But this is the invitation to take this in service of awakening and then to integrate it from your meditation practice into your life. So I also was born in Brooklyn <laughs> and my parents never took me out into nature. My first nature experiences was, as I described, was when I first, you know, went into nature in college. I never knew how to backpack. It's a miracle I survived. I just went out and did it. Um, but I think that what's beautiful, and actually I learned this, gosh, in 1990. Too. I think I did the first really uh, documentary about climate. It was called Oceans of Air. And I told the story through indigenous culture, um, the Native American, you know, 
living in the Pacific Northwest, I use their mythology to explain how this landscape evolved. And so what I did learn was their, their name for their spirit or their God was called Kwati. And Kwati translates into the changer. What a beautiful, beautiful way of looking at, you know, the ultimate spiritual being as the changer. Um, and I think that that revelation that I discovered where that, you know, life is change, you know, and everything is always changing and morphing into each other and metamorphosizing. My, you know, fantastic, you know, fungi is all about the mycelium and the fungi. I mean, is it the end of life or the beginning of life? You know, because things are broken down into their individual components, which is what fungi do for life to regenerate. People always look at it as decomposition, as a as a negative thing, as a bad thing, but maybe it's not. It's simply just recycling energy for the circle to, to be complete. And um, no, I just, when once you see it that way, and talking about not getting addicted to things, you don't have to do psychedelics more than once, perhaps, in your life. Once you get it, was it Alan Moss who said, once you get it, hang up? Um, it's like you, the question now is, how are you going to integrate that wisdom that you got, that gift of wisdom of nature's intelligence into your personal relationships, into your community, into, you know, the world? How are you going to activate the wisdom of seeing the harmony, how everything is interconnected, and how when it is all interconnected, it encourages life to flourish? What a beautiful thing. That's why I think I could have been a biologist as much as I could have become a filmmaker because I look at those rhythms and patterns of biology and see it as the blueprint for how to live your life. It's a spiritual practice to be able to observe biology because it evolved over billions of years. And it's all about, you know, communities flourish when everybody works together. There's no greed, nobody hoards. It's all about regeneration, reconnection, symbiosis, mutualism. These are the things we need right now in our society, right? With the polarization yeah. that's happening. Mm -hmm. It's the feminine side of nature that we need to applaud, not the macho side of Kill or Be Killed, which is a nature documentaries, which I don't like. You know, survival of the fittest, the top of the food chain. Billions of interactions are happening every second right now in the micro microbial level, but between pollinators and flowers, billions of interactions are happening right now that that we don't acknowledge on Discovery Channel when it's Shark Week, which gets ratings, you know, so we need to honor the other side, the foundation of life. And there comes through this, I love what you're saying, a kind of absolutely innate compassion and tenderness because it's us it's like if you you know if you hurt your hand you don't say oh poor hand maybe i should take care of it right it's it's you and the whole <clears throat> gift of meditation and sacred attention or loving awareness is to see that it is all you that it's do as you're saying that so um on one of our we had these large retreat Stan Groff and I and others uh, with holotropic breathwork hours of breathing with intense music and hundreds of people in the room and I invited my twin brother who is a scientist he was a kind of pretty respected geneticist and population biologist and this was, you know um, to come he'd also taken his psychedelics in the day and we lay down next to each other and we did this deep breathing for a few hours not talking at all and we both you know the room dissolved and there was the music and everything became energy or light in its different ways and we both found ourselves in the womb it's independently just lying next to each other it was someone's as we all had sitters who would help us and tend us um and then we each got born again um and we came out of it we looked at each other and we said wow we were back there in that little space, <laughs> space together, and here we are. And there was something mysterious about feeling ourselves 
what you're talking about, being part of the universe, birthing us in all these forms. And it was a really, my brother died a couple of years later from mm. blood cancer. And this was one of the experiences that kind of in our later life got us back to that incredible sense of opening and awakening. <clears throat> and people say, well, are these experiences is, is enlightenment and meditation, whatever that is, the same as enlightenment. And say, the sacred is the sacred. Yeah. You know, the beauty is beauty, consciousness, who we are is consciousness. Yeah. And whether it's these substances or walking in the high mountains and remembering, feeling that mystery that you're part of it, or making love, or taking psychedelic, or sitting with someone when they're dying. And you're in the face of this mystery when spirit leaves the bo- consciousness leaves the body um, silent like a falling star. And you know that it's not the body, that who we are actually is consciousness itself that inhabits this body and that the earth is conscious, that this is what we are. So all of this comes revealed. Um, and then we get to live, as you say, Louis, with that understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we need to try to figure out how to integrate that in every way, you know, and, and what that means is cherishing life, being respectful for life. You know, I know you're a Buddhist, but you don't want to step on any living creature, but neither do I. You know, I if I see a bug on the ground or an ant, I walk around it. Yes. I, I admire it. I, I worship it. The beauty of its architectural design, it, it's, it's all sacred. It's very, and, and once you sort of lean into that direction, how else can you live your life? I mean, there's no difference between being environmentally conscious or socially conscious, you know? It's all one and the same. And that becomes the values we need, I think, to shape our societies, our, our culture, our civilization. Let's just all get on board with protecting life. Let's all get on board of protecting what we love. It's easy. It's really easy. It's not political. It's it's an emotional connection to the energy that is sacred. And you can find it everywhere. A, a blade of grass cracking through the crack in the sidewalk. I used to walk through the alleys in Venice and shoot stuff all the time. And, you know, so even if you're not a filmmaker, to those that are listening, I really encourage everyone to seek out beauty everywhere you go. It can be the light bouncing off a leaf in the tree. It could be the crack in the sidewalk. It could be the graffiti on the wall. Whatever touches the deepest part of your soul, whatever makes that connection, be open to that. And I think a lot of times when people watch my films, and the common reaction is, oh my God. And then what does oh my God mean? Oh means it made you present. My means it connects with your soul. And God is that spiritual energy we all want to be connected to. The jaw drops, that's a cool thing. Oh my God. So finally, like you, I, I, I caught your attention. We caught your consciousness, get you out of that, you know, rat race thing. And if you can, you know, again, it's just another way of being, having a mindfulness practice, because what does it do? It makes you present. Wow, look at that. And and when people come out of my films many times with tears and they, and, you know, they cry, and I know it's not a sad movie, <laughs> but it's because I think it touched their soul. So what I'm capturing is universal. I'm just a conduit. It isn't my art. I'm just transferring energy to you. These rhythms and patterns that are universal, right? The rhythms and patterns that are on Mars are the same that are the neural networks in your brain that are the same in the microchondria in your cell. And when you see it, you recognize it. And because you recognize it, it's a homecoming. It's a homecoming. And that's why I believe it's also healing when people have said, they look at you know, the moving art series and everything from children with autism, the teenagers that are suicidal, people with cancer, end of life, all the above. They say it's a healing modality without me ever proclaiming it's a healing modality because they are looking at a mirror of life going forward, of healing energy. This is the rhythm and metabolism that makes life go forward. Don't we want to be on that train? Don't we want to be on that? 
or do you want to be on something that's like dead <laughs> um, or negative? So this whole idea of looking at these rhythms and patterns is sacred. So when you say, so to me, I should so touch when you, you know, invite us to look for beauty everywhere. Um, in a way, our meditation practice, because they come together and you said it so directly to become mindful. And I like the phrase mindful, loving awareness, because it's an awareness that actually pays attention with the heart as, as woven into it, um, that we learn the practices and we take the time to quiet the mind, right. to open the heart in the simplest way. And that doesn't mean it's all, you know, um, happy. Um, if you get close enough to nature, as you say, it's being born and it's dying and it's growing and it's decaying. Um, and it has to do that. And there's a wonder in it. I was going to hold up a flower. I had a flower behind me. I will hold it up. But oh. it turns out that the flower is also already started in its, in its decay. Yeah. Right? Here's, your, here's your enlightenment. This is it. It was beautiful in one form. I have a friend who did a book called, um, it was something like, uh, uh, I forget the title. It was something like Disappearing Beauty. And it was photos of flowers as they were fading. Um, the mindfulness, the practice that we have says, well, look at this wonder. How, where did this come from? This is extraordinary. And it is going through the remarkable changes that uh, everything on life, what you're, what you're describing. So meditation, like the beauty, you is, is, the, is the doorway to right. see this with, in its glory. Yeah. You know, I realize that we should probably take a few of the questions and sure. comments just because this is so much fun and we want to invite you to come in in that way, too. Can yeah. um, So can you bring a person or two onto the screen and we can... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Emily. Yes. You, you guys, it's been really fun behind the scenes because you've been answering the questions <laughs> as quickly as they come in. So thanks so much. Okay. Our first question is from Victoria, who asks... What is your favorite psychedelic integration story? I find we best learn from these narratives connecting us to our humanness and the integration story is not often shared as much as the story of the trip. Feel so my first response, Victoria, is to ask what yours is. I will answer, but you ask, what makes you ask this? You must have some story. Well, I first want to say thank you so much to both of you for awakening so much awe and beauty in all of us. Um, you know, the story that comes to mind, I'm a therapist and I work with a lot of folks, both with breathwork practice, a behaviorist, with psychedelics. And a woman came to me recently and after she had this journey, we've been integrating with some breathwork actually. And she said, in the breathwork, I kept crying. And in each session, I kept crying and going back into these memories of this trauma and letting it come up and out. And in the last session, I didn't cry. And I said, well, what do you think that's about? And she said, I'm learning to live with this now. I got into the feeling of this is now a part of me, this knowing. And now I get to live with this. And it was a get to live with this. It wasn't I have to live with this. So for me, it was extremely profound combination of, you know, the psychedelic breath work and the psychedelic uh, entheogenic medicines coming together and creating this really beautiful synergy in this woman's body where she's learning to live with new parts of herself that at one point were hidden. Um, so that's what comes to mind for me. Zen master, Sung San Sansini, the Korean Zen master I studied with in the 70s and loved people would ask him questions and sometimes he would look back and he'd say, you already understand. And so you gave a gorgeous answer to the very question that you raised. Louis, anything to add or? 
just a yeah, I, th- I think well just yeah i mean n- not much other than it's really personal i think when it comes to the integration i think we all have a chance to look at whatever trauma we have and by it's same thing with mindfulness looking at it the 360 point of view enables us to really understand it and either let go or move on mm-hmm. and i i think of this person again who is given a pretty high dose of psychedelics as part of treatment for end-stage cancer was in in the last week or two of his life. And he'd been a very angry person. Um, And he saw the pain of the world and he realized it wasn't personal. And he saw the beauty of the world and he realized that that wasn't personal. There was something bigger than that. Um, In fact, he said when he came out of it, I saw God. And he was somebody who was never taught, not religious at all. But what happened then, the people around him said, he began to view everyone with kindly eyes. Mm-hmm. That what happened to him changed how he related to all the human beings that came into his or- orbit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I suppose I could say we're also flowers, kind of some strange flowers, but we are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's try another. Yeah. Okay, our next question is from Anne Spaulding. Anne asks, can psychedelics help with chronic high anxiety? Is there any danger of setting off high anxiety with its use? What type of person should you be with during a trip? Is there an organization of such people? And maybe can it help with existential fears? I am. Go ahead, Louis. Well, I, no, I was, when people ask those kind of questions, I, I suggest... Uh, maps.org, I think, is a website that has some good information. Maps, maps. M-A-P-S. We'll put it in M-A-P-S, the yeah, dot org. You know, for looking for the um, right connections to therapists and, and, and information. Um, I think everyone has to be very careful. Um, I've heard that schizophrenics should not do it, but it's a very, you know, uh, personal uh, question. Everyone's different. It's not for everybody. But in general, I think for most people that uh, it's, quote unquote, safe, especially if you try to microdose, which is just taking a tiny fraction and being able to see how do you feel about that. Um, Yeah, I just want to say I did psychedelics in my teenage years um, and generally had a wonderful, mind blowing experience. So, you know, but I'm older now. And so. I don't know if anyone has had experience with that. And do yeah. I assume that if I had that kind of experience as a teenager that I, I will? I think, just and I, I, swear, I think it'll be way better. I've had so many people like you because of the 60s and 70s, you know, they did it recreationally, mm-hmm. in maybe in a more of a party situation. But I also you know, did not do psychedelics for a long period of time, raising my children, maybe 25 years, you know, and then was reintroduced to it. And I have to tell you, for me, it was a deeper, more uh, spiritual experience because I'm different. I'm older. I got some I got some mag- baggage and mileage under my belt and I see the world differently. And um, so many uh, people our age, quote unquote, I think um, ask that question because it did go into a dark hole because of the, you know, uh, laws that, of all people. Richard Nixon declared mushrooms a Schedule One drug. Someone who was actually a convicted who had to be pardoned for being a felon, and we're suffering the results of that not only because of psychedelics, mass incarceration. Today, it's still going on because of one guy who was a crook. <laughs> So we have to uh, take a little bit of a perspective on what happened and realize we should have just continued on this evolutionary path. So I also want to add to Anne, this is a beautiful question that you raise. Um, and it is individual. There, first of all, um, Congress, this is sort of the new era. Congress um, and the, the Veterans Administration just yeah. Passed legislation authorizing the use of psychedelics for veterans who have severe PTSD um, and using different substances like MDMA um, and, and psilocybin and sometimes ketamine treatment. 
because the evidence is so powerful, not for everyone, but for many people, this is one of the most effective things to do to rewire the, the inner system. Really what it does, it's a shift of consciousness and identity. You're caught in the identity of the trauma that happened and the anxiety, which means that your alarm system is on and it won't stop. And then that opening to the sacred, uh, and it's not always easy. This isn't like, oh, I'm gonna have a happy trip and it's all gonna be angels. Right. You might actually have to go back through the trauma and feel it in a way that you run away from your whole life or not been able to hold. And that's why it's important to have someone with you, that this is not something you do alone. You find somebody who's good and generally a good guy so that when you get the places that are painful or difficult, someone says, relax, make space. This is part of the dance. And you realize that. And then there comes a kind of great freedom that comes out of it to say, oh, I can feel all of this because who I am is actually the, the loving awareness itself. So it's, it's the gateway to a kind of inner freedom. And for many people, that's really beneficial. That's beautiful. So we have time for one more, maybe. Thank you, Anne. That was a great yeah. question. Thank you both. Okay, let me find, okay. Our nurse says, I took LSD a dozen times in college. It was a wonderful opening to much of what you've been describing. But my last trip was terrifying, and ex I experienced a severe panic attack. I've not only taken psychedelics or marijuana since then. I'm now 66 and have practiced Vipassana for over three decades and taught it for over 20. I'm curious about doing this myself, but feel reluctance based on what happened so long ago. Do you have any advice on whether or not this is safe to do? So I, I want to say something and let, let Louis have the last word, perhaps. Yeah. Um, just want, I want to pause and respect what you're doing, both what you learned in your meditation, how you offer this to others. Um, when it's unguided and there's not understanding, then a bad trip where you get to paranoia and fear and you feel like, oh, this substance makes me do this and I better avoid it. And there's something wise about that because you don't have the right set and setting to manage it but it's the same in meditation people will come on a long retreat and then they get to some really difficult place and where it feels like they're they're dying or they're reviewing their life in ways they regret deeply and they feel so much pain and they come in and they work with a teacher who says this is part of being human now hold it in compassion now breathe now realize that you can feel where the pain is in your body. Um, now you can sit with it and it transforms it. The same is true in the psychedelic experience. So your experience back then was without the proper set and setting and without the map and someone to help you. But in fact, you have to, in some way, courageously pass through the difficulty that you were not able to face, your fears, your panic. We all have that, it's wired in. And realize, like Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, Mara comes with all the armies and the fear, and you touch the earth, which is what Louis is saying. You come back to the earth, and you realize, oh, this is workable. Uh, and you keep your seat. And then there comes a kind of freedom that's very different than just tripping for its own sake, but instead finding that. So it's not for everybody, but... Your, your your great question says this is what we need to do it well. Louis, you get the last. Okay, well, no, I, I I agree with everything Jack said, and and if look if you have already a really good uh, mindfulness practice, if you feel very centered, when I've done it alone in nature, I'm not alone. The trees are my guides. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm with family, and I I can just lay on the on the earth right there and. And if, my, if all my molecules fell apart, I'm okay with it. It's not like I'm joyful about that. I have no fear about it either. I'm okay. I'm just okay, you know? And so, um, but I think with people that knowingly have certain fears and traumas, definitely they should work with, I think, a professional therapist and, and be more cautious in, in taking perhaps a journey 
Um, so yeah, I agree with what Jack had to say. And and there he is with the flower. And what so what did the Buddha actually say with the flower? I'd love to end on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Mm. Thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for your great questions today. A uh, recording will be emailed to everyone who registered. So I know there was so much information covered. <laughs> It'll be good to watch again. Uh, you can also find it on our YouTube channel at Banyan Together. Uh, there'll be a free link offered in uh, the chat for everybody who's maybe interested in checking out our ongoing psychedelic integration groups happening on Banyan. We have groups starting next week. So it's a great time to connect with others, talk about your <laughs> experiences with other people all over the world. Uh, and we'll also put in the chat a link to Louie's channel, uh, 